Hello, BookTube. I have a bit of a Monday reads for you. A bunch of, of books to torture your TBR. <laughs> uh, all kinds of things that may be of interest. And the first one, which may not be of interest, I don't know what to make of it at all. But uh, as as my, my friend Deb said in one of our rare team-up videos a long time ago, I'll read anything. <laughs> if it's new and it comes across my plate, I will give it a completely fair and eager shake to see what it is. I have... I have had so many pleasant surprises that it, by doing that that I would never abandon that as a practice. Although I'm not sure that this one is going to count. This is <laughs> this is Jughead: The Hunger, Volume One. <laughs> In case you're wondering, uh, it's the Jughead. It's it's the <laughs> it's uh it's Jughead from Archie, the hamburger. Eater <laughs> from Archie Comics, who I guess in this in, in this anthology uh, is has the curse of a werewolf. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with the Archie Comics. I don't follow weekly comics at all. Uh, but this had to have been a regular thing, and now it has been collected. And it says Volume One, so there's probably Volume Two out there somewhere. <laughs> uh, and it's just too bizarre not to attract my attention. If this is a, a Riverdale adventure in which Jughead is a werewolf, or at least appears to be one. <laughs> We'll give it a try. Uh, then this next one is by a Titan uh, in the genre. Uh, I think this comes out in the spring. Yeah, this comes out in May. This is Lent by the great Joe Walton. And it is, it is a fantastic cover. And it is a, a kind of a historical science fiction mismatch of Fantasia about uh, Girolamo Savonarola, <laughs> about the, the mad monk who briefly took over Florence from the Medici family because he had the mob at his back and because he had religion at his fingertips, despite the fact that he was he was no great friend of the Vatican. Uh, he, he was the author, the, the creator, the instigator of the infamous Bonfire of the Vanities, where families in, in Florence were encouraged, compelled, watched to deliver up their luxuries for public burning. And so we're talking gowns and jewels and furniture, fancy furniture, and, uh, and whatnot. But we're also talking paintings, and worst of all, books. God only knows what what was lost in the bonfires of the vanities that this that Savonarola oversaw and fanatically insisted on. And, you know, as, <laughs> as a, a, a famous German philosopher and poet once said, when you start burning by burning books, you end up burning men, and that exact same thing happens to Volnerola. But this is, this is a, a fantasy about him. Uh, let me, uh, can I read you a bit about this? Do I have anything about this? Uh, it's, it's Joe Walton, so it, uh, so, uh, you know, I don't really, it had, comes with recommendations, but I don't really need them. With Joe Walton, you 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 know you're going to get something good. You know it's going to be nice and solid. Uh, okay, young Girolamo's life is a series of miracles. It's a miracle that he can see demons plain as day, and that he can cast them out with the force of his will. It's a miracle that whenever Girolamo preaches, crowds swoon. It's a miracle that, despite the Pope's determination to bring young Girolamo to heel, he's still on the loose and now running Florence in all but name. That's only the beginning. Because Savonarola is not who or what he thinks he is. I don't know what that could mean. Uh, I, I, I don't know what that could mean. Uh, I mean, if this were a normal historical novel, the reveal would be maybe that he was homosexual. Uh, it certainly isn't that he was a woman, because we have a portrait of him that was drawn from life, and it's just not possible. <laughs> or it could be that he is supernatural in league with supernatural creatures himself. Uh, in which case, he had a, he had a grisly end. If you had any kind of supernatural powers, you would have saved yourself from that end. So we shall see. Uh, we shall see. I I, uh, I would read Joe Walton writing about anything, but writing about the Italian Renaissance, writing about characters uh, about whom I know everything there is to know. They, they feel like old friends, but I, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Uh, so that comes out in May. Then we have some uh, some finished copy reads. This one I've been I've been very amiss getting to this. This is. Uh, this is Greg Isles. This is Cemetery Road. In a beautiful finished copy. This is it's got the gold gilt letters and the, the deckled edges. And uh, I love this author. Just love him. I, I was tremendously impressed by his original trilogy. Uh, the the big I mean, it, was, it wasn't the original books that he wrote, but it was a 
it was a, a big attention grabbing ambitious trilogy that started with Natchez Burning uh, and I was tremendously impressed by those books they, I don't know what they are I think they sold to his core of fan base on the idea of Faulknerian thrillers but they transcended any easy description I just started to call him referring to especially Natchez Burning as just a great novel uh, so and, and so when I got the advanced copy of this thing, I was eager to jump right into it, and yet I didn't. So this is a finished copy for March that I'm, I'll be getting right into. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know quite how to categorize this author, but I strongly recommend him. Uh, at your used bookstore, at your next flea market or yard sale or whatever, you will almost certainly see a copy of Not Just Burning. It's enormous. It's like 900 pages long. But you'll love it. You won't stop reading. I can't think of a reader who wouldn't love it. So, uh, so I highly recommend that, and I'll probably end up recommending this. I, I find it hard to believe that this author would let something come to the public press that wasn't, that didn't meet his exacting standards. We shall see. Uh, this next one, no exacting standards involved, <laughs> but I had the advanced copy, and I haven't got to it. I know already how utterly annoying it's going to be, uh, but I, I, I need to read these things. This is, this is, so to speak, my beat. I, I try not to pick and choose if. I have 15 or 16 broad subject matters, broad genres, and my goal, at least for now in my life, is to try and read every major release in all of those things, in all of those genres. I don't, I don't have any excuses otherwise. I have a low-demand dog. I don't work. I hardly ever sleep. I read really fast. So I have no excuse not to keep my head barely at level of those books. So, And this is one of them. So it doesn't matter that I already know this author's bag of tricks. He doesn't have a very big bag of tricks. I, it doesn't matter that I know he's going to annoy me. I'll read it and see what uh, what facts are of interest. This is Michael Behe. This is Darwin Devolves, the new science about DNA that challenges evolution. Of course there are Darwin's finches on the cover. Uh, in Darwin's black box, biochemist Michael Behe uh, challenged Darwin's theory of evolution, arguing that the results of science itself have demonstrated intelligent design is a better explanation for the development of life, and that his contention to that effect was completely and thoroughly debunked, not only in scientific literature, but in a court of law. There is nowhere left to say that there is any case to be made other than the Institute for Creation Research, or, or the Discovery Institute, or whatever whatever name this this fraud bank is going under, but but in no other arena does that book or anything that it claims stand as a challenge to Darwin or evolution, much less an invocation on scientific grounds of intelligent design. It doesn't stand. It was it has an, it was entirely exploded line by line. Uh, but anyway, anyway. Uh, uh, and also, intelligent design is not an explanation. The publisher says a better explanation for the development of life, but intelligent design is not an explanation for the development of life, much less a better one. It doesn't explain anything. It has no explanatory power. Saying a, a, a supernatural being did this by means that we don't understand, for reasons that we don't understand, at a time that we don't understand, is not explaining anything. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, now, more than 20 years after the publication of the controversial bestseller, he radically advances his argument, presenting a cutting-edge research that confirms a startling account of how Darwin's mechanism actually works, undermining the foundation of the theory. Nothing like that is true. Nothing like that is true. That is, those are the raving alternate reality fantasies of creationists, of intelligent design. This guy calls himself a scientist. <laughs> But you, he doesn't have ten intelligent designers in mind. And he doesn't have Lord Brahma in mind either. He has one particular designer in mind. <laughs> one particular version of a designer in mind. He would embrace the actual theory of evolution by natural selection and the actual theories of cosmology, of the beginning of life, of abiogenesis. He would embrace those and abandon his version of intelligent design and creationism in a heartbeat, if it looked like he was going to be forced to acknowledge the Norse pantheon or the ancient Egyptian pantheon, I have no idea what he would do. Uh, if, if all of a sudden Amon Re, if, if his quote unquote ev evidence was trending towards Amon Re, he would abandon the whole idea and say, Oh, what are you talking about? That's fantasy. <laughs> so he has one particular intelligent designer in mind, and he doesn't have any intelligent design to point to. 
everything he points to is not intelligent book design. It looks exactly like it would look if it was hobbled together piecemeal by blind natural processes. Any intelligent designer would work it differently, would have made these things simpler and easier. And the only intelligent, the only creationist comeback to that is to say, well, this intelligent designer has mysterious reasons for why he does these things. Not she, not they, why he does these things. He has mysterious reasons. So you're, blo you're explaining one mystery with another mystery. It's just charlatanism from start to finish. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Michael Behe is no stranger to controversy as he has expected Darwin devolves is earning him the ire of devout Darwinists there are no devout Darwinists yet quote neither Darwin nor his contemporaries knew about the cellular or molecular levels of life Behe explains no they didn't they were 150 years ago of course they didn't know only now do we know that sophisticated gene systems underlie virtually all of life Systems that can't be built by the fiercely degrading action of mutation and selection. I haven't even read a word of this book. And mutation and selection is not fiercely degrading. So your basic your professed understanding of the thing you're trying to demolish is completely wrong. <laughs> it's completely wrong. It, it, it's like saying... <laughs> it's like saying, you meteorologists, you have this all wrong, and I can conclusively prove that cumulonimbus clouds are not made of taffy candy. So every time you write one of your fancy schmancy textbooks and say that they are made of taffy candy, you're just wrong. The latest science proves they're not. I, we all know that. <laughs> you, are, you are completely misunderstanding your subject. And then making a public living off it. Uh, anyway. <laughs> anyway. As you can see, that is a kind of a preview. This is this is a late February book, so it, uh, but it is actually the advanced copy is actually on my pile of February books that I want to get to. Uh, so whether I do or not, I don't know. Maybe I'll just bash it online for a bit. <laughs> but uh, this next one is fascinating, and I don't believe this is a February book. I think this is this is March. I hope that these aren't all February books. Oh no, this is a February book as well. Oh God. Uh, well, and this one I don't. I never even got an advanced copy of it. I don't think. Uh, but I do want to get to it. I guess maybe I'll... This is this is uh, uh, edited and translated by Ken Liu, who I guess never sleeps. <laughs> and this is an anthology called Broken Stars, Contemporary Chinese Science Fiction in Translation. And he, he edits the thing and translates everything. So I, <laughs> this is a prodigious amount of work. Uh, this is also a late February release, so I'm late on this. Uh, I just got it, and I, I, I haven't even dipped my toe into it. I really need to... Well, I'll be doing it... I'll be doing it uh, this week, and if if it sparks a review, then it sparks a review. I'm hoping that it does. Uh, but now I'm wondering how many of these things are uh, are February releases. Okay, good. This one is March. As if I, I never thought I would say good about a March release, but nevertheless. This is uh, Tom Baldwin's book, Control-Alt-Delete. How, how Politics and the Media Crashed Our Democracy. Um It'll be about Twitter and Facebook and Russian bots, but it is essentially another example of a Trump book. We're getting a... The authors of these things would never call them Trump books, but that is not only the, the wave they're hoping to ride, but also the psychic trauma that produced the book in the first place. So I don't even need to look at the index to know whether or not Trump is all over this, even if he's not all over by name. The, the, the epistemic... The, the, the systemological doubts that he has produced about whether or not our democracy has crashed. Our democracy obviously has not crashed. <laughs> our democracy obviously has not crashed. Because it was, if it crashed, it was crashed by someone. And if it was crashed by someone, you have to assume that it was crashed by the people who took control of every single branch of local, state, municipal, and, and federal government in 2016. And those people lost a lot of that territory back in 2020 or in 2018, and could lose even more in 2020. So, obviously our democracy has not crashed. Democracies that crash don't work like that. Uh, and th that could just be a sensationalist title, but one way or another, I want to read this, I want to see what the author has to say about uh, all the latest discoveries about how social media has warped that whole process. That will be fascinating, if depressing, anyway. Uh, and as long as we're on the subject, some of these, some of these books that are Trump books fly under their true colors, and this is the, a big one. This is a revised and updated version of uh, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, in which a bunch of, what we have, 37 psychiatrists and mental health experts assess 
a president. And this, this book came out, uh, this is a much larger and more exhaustive book with plenty more examples to draw from, of a bunch of professionals putting their professional uh, reputations on the line by defying the so-called McGovern rule, in which professionals are, are forbidden by their, by their uh, discipline from diagnosing people who are not their patients, who they have not interviewed, who they have not met or examined, no, no armchair psychologizing from the cheap seats of people in public life. You can say in private that the person looks, behaves exactly like some of my patients, but you can't diagnose them and, and, and use your professional credentials to do that. And uh, more and more psychologists have been uh, ignoring that. They've been ignoring the McGovern rule because Trump presents such an egregious case. Of that, if you if you stitch together as people have done, if you stitch together thirty written transcripts of some of his comments, some of his longer comments or speeches, if you stitch together those transcripts and take his name off them, put them together in a PDF and hand them around to people who are the relatives, who have relatives who are suffering from severe mental illness and especially um, deep narcissistic disorders. Those relatives, not knowing who who is the author of these things, will say, "Oh my God, we went through the exact same thing," the, where grandma, grandpa suddenly didn't know what he was talking about, and he was still angry and commanding enough so they didn't want to be told that it was a nightmare for our family. And the, those those people will often read those transcripts and say, "Oh, who is this person? Is there any way I can contact the family? Let them know they're not alone. My support group meant everything to me." And when they learn that it's the president of the United States, they are slack-jawed with horror, as anybody should be. Uh, and this is that was the prompting for these professionals to sort of step outside of what's usually accepted in their field. And I'm, I'm of two minds. I read The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump in the original edition. I'm going to read this new expanded edition and see what's in it. I, I'm of two minds on it. Because on the one hand, I don't think... Uh, on the one hand, I agree with the McGovern rule. To, to the limited extent that I think that psychotherapy is legitimate at all, it gains its legitimacy only by direct personal interaction and examination. It cannot be done, uh, you know, two people removed. It cannot be done through a TV <laughs> or through Twitter. It has to have a per that personal element in which the psycho a psychotherapist brings training to bear to listen, to elicit subjects, that responses from the subject, that sort of thing. On the one hand, I think that. But on the other hand, I think, uh, you know, this is not a borderline case anymore. I mean, in my mind, since I, I, have been, I have been studying Donald Trump for 30 years, I don't think it's ever been uh, borderline. But it's not borderline anymore. Certainly since he took power, his mental deficiencies have become front and center. He doesn't even trouble to hide them. And he has terrified not only his staff but also the Republican Party to the extent that they won't highlight them either. You get these people alone in private, and they say, yeah, the guy's completely insane. He can't even follow a conversation. Uh, and it's a mean kind of insanity. Some of these people worked with Reagan. And they will also say, yeah, we would try to talk to him about policy, and then he would he would wander off into an anecdote or a memory of some kind. And it was, it was wonderful and warm, and he loved us being there, but we didn't get any work done. Those, some of those people now are in the same position working for a different Republican president who's losing his mind, and they say it's completely different. It's mean. It's, it's, it's aware and mean. Um, so on the other hand, I think, well, on the one hand, I think, you know, of course, the McGovern rule is correct. You shouldn't be professionally diagnosing someone that you don't have any professional access to. And on the other hand, I think, well, but we're all watching this happen in real time, and this guy can really hurt the world. <laughs> so... It's at least interesting to read. I'm not sure that it should be happening in public. I'm not sure that it should be any kind of a book deal. Uh, the, the ethics just get trampled underfoot when you start to get into the weeds like that. But it's new and expanded, and I, I, am, I have resigned to reading Trump books, and they are going to come out in new and expanded editions from now until 2024. So uh, we'll just do it. Like I said about the Behe book, this is my beat. This is what I do. It's not only my job, it's also my uh, my an incredible passion of mine. So you take the good with the bad when you have something like that. Uh, and then there's this last one, which won't take more than an hour to read, and I don't think we'll deal with much. I don't know 
the date on this thing. I don't have a pub sheet of any kind, uh, but it's Oxford, so it's probably late. This is probably a February release. This is by Sarah Giorgini, and it is uh, Household Gods, The Religious Lives of the Adams Family. <laughs> that is not not Charles Adams is a horrible family, but with Lurch and Morticia and whatnot. But the the Adamses that were the founding political and social dynasty in America, uh, and it's a short book, but it could be even shorter. <laughs> I can't wait to see what kind of mental gymnastics this author does because there was no the religious life of the the Adamses were all effectively atheists. I mean, they paid lip service, they did what they had to do, but. <laughs> it's just I can't wait to see what this author does. She is who is she? She's a native of Brooklyn, and she earned her doctorate in history from Boston University. And she's the series editor for the papers of John Adams, uh, which is part of the Adams Papers editorial project based in Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston. So she and I have probably bumped elbows at the Brattle Bookshop, but nevertheless, this is the very definition of an uphill climb. <laughs> How you are going to import? Uh, well, maybe she doesn't. Maybe she she won't. But if you if you if you try to import a devote inner religious belief life to any generation of the Adams family, you are I don't know how you're gonna do that. I know their correspondence, private and public, as well as anyone who is at that uh, at the historical society. And this is a family of atheists. It just was not an act of concern. So, there was lip service, but there was always lip service, unless you were, you know, Ben Franklin or whatever. But uh, I, anyway, it won't take me long to read. And of course, I mean, it's entirely Adams and Boston, so I have to read it. I try never to miss a book on this family at all. And to my great joy, it looks like in April, I may be reviewing a book on John and John Quincy Adams. I, it's the weakest link, even I will admit, it's the weakest link in a provisional April uh, schedule for the Christian Science Monitor, but I'm hoping. <laughs> I'm hoping that nothing stronger comes along and knocks it off, because I would love to do that. I'll do it anyway for, for open letters, but anyway, that is uh, a bit of a Monday Reads <laughs> to torture your TBRs, uh, and also because I imagine these things are interesting to you just to know what's new and what's coming out, what's already out just recently, right? It's not, it's not a question. Of, I think these things would be interesting to you anyway, and we're all here for the books. Uh, so we have Household Gods, about the religious lives of the Adams family. It could have been an index card. Uh, then we have uh, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. This is a, a significantly enlarged edition of a book in which a bunch of psychologists diagnosed the public behavior and pronouncements of Donald Trump. So, uh, I, I mean, if you, if, if I'm sure if we were to ask Juan at Just One Reader, he would say, no, you can't do that. You cannot do that. You can opine, but you cannot diagnose until you meet the patient many times. But I bet he would also say, you know, just informally, obviously there's something wrong with the man. I just, I don't know where I stand on the, on the book's existence. I will give it, I will give it a read anyway, because it does exist. Uh, then control all delete about the, the toxic admixture of uh, social media and politics. When social media should be exclusively for dog and cat pictures, the way God intended. Uh, then uh, broken stars. Uh, an anthology of new translations of Chinese science fiction by Ken Liu, who's of course no stranger. He's the best known Chinese science fiction writer. Uh, then Darwin devolves, but he does not. <laughs> he does not. This is just the latest book that somehow a charlatan managed to get a book deal for. But I'll see what specific things he says this time around, what specific latest scientific study that's 10 years old that he misinterprets or misunderstands. I, I we'll see what he does. Uh, then then uh, Cemetery Road by Greg Isles who I have, I have no compunction at all in calling a great writer. He's a great novelist. So no matter where you stand, no matter where you, you encounter him, no matter what book of his you encounter, read him. Definitely read him. And get this book out of the library. Get your library to order a copy of this. This is a new book. comes out real soon. And uh, it, it's going to be great. I mean, it's one of the only things on this, this pile where I can just say already, it's going to be great. And, and this is another one. <laughs> Lent. By Joe Walton, in which she does something Joe Waltony with Savona Rola. I don't know what. I can't wait to find out. Uh, and last but not least, or maybe last and least, I don't really know, Jughead as a werewolf. <laughs> I love my job. <laughs> so I, I don't know what to make of Jughead the werewolf, but uh, I'll let you know. <laughs> so, so that's it for now, uh, but I will probably be back. So I will see you soon. Thank you, Book 2.